Hello, I'm Connie Smith, and oh, what a year it has been, and an important one in the city of Hamilton. From the unpredictability of COVID-19 to the approval of the LRT, record levels of building permits, yet sobering concerns about homelessness. And then how about those Thai cats? As 2021 comes to a close, we're going to look back on the challenges and triumphs the city faced head on, and we'll look ahead to 2022 and see what that year will bring to the city we all love and call home. And we're going to do that with Hamilton Mayor Fred Eisenberger. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Good to see you. How are you? I'm great, great. You know what, the uh, city's doing great. Uh, we're moving through some challenging times and the community at large has really stepped up and uh, helped us through that. So uh, I'm feeling very optimistic about uh, the future of our city and uh, our community going forward. So uh, feeling great. Good to hear. And we count our blessings this time of year. We do, we're grateful for what we have, but our thoughts also turn to those less fortunate, those in need, those who may not have a home, mm -hmm. a place to lay their heads at night. And here we are in the middle of a, an affordability, affordable housing crisis, and of course the encampments. Um, very difficult. Um, how do you see us navigating through this in the weeks and months ahead? Yeah, you know what, uh, it's been uh, particularly challenging through this pandemic. It, uh, it really has accelerated some of our social challenges uh, in all of our communities, whether it's here or right across the country. Uh, the, uh, the housing issue with house pricing going up 30% year over year has been particularly challenging as well for those that are trying to get into the market or get uh, you know, affordable rents. And that's not something the municipality can, can actively control. What we have been doing, though, is uh, you know investing about $120 million every year on housing and homelessness and mm -hmm. providing affordable housing for folks in our social housing network. Uh, the city of Hamilton has about 7,000 social, social affordable housing units that we manage, and the private sector, not-for-profit sector, has about 7,000 units as well. So about 14,000 units that we uh, manage overall to try and provide housing opportunities for, uh, for folks in our community. I'll tell you, m from my personal perspective, uh, I grew up in geared to income housing uh, in the east end of the city of Hamilton, and it was the kind of hand up that, uh, that helped our family get to be in a better place for all the kids and children, which is the, you know, the aspiration of every immigrant family that comes to our, to our country or come uh, to our town. And I'm a huge believer in providing that kind of hand up and assistance and support for everyone in our community to the best degree possible. The sad reality, though, is that uh, it needs to be safe and secure housing. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, tents are not safe and secure environments mm -hmm. for people to be living in. So we're doing everything possible on a day-to-day -day basis, working with those individuals to try and get them into safe and secure locations, a roof over their head, and hopefully with supports that uh, can help them with whatever issues they're dealing with. So that's our, that's our goal. That's our mission. Uh, we have a significant amount of staff that are working on this uh, every day. And uh, that, is, that, that is work that is not going to stop. Our thoughts also right now turn to the first responders, the frontline workers who have kept us fed, housed, safe and cared for over the past year and beyond. It's amazing how though a year ago we were in shutdowns, travel advisories, and then came some good news with the rollout of the vaccine. So looking back on that rollout, how, how are you dealing with that? I mean, it's emotional, it's wonderful. This is what we were hoping for, but at the same time, the logistics are very, very daunting. They are, you know, interestingly enough, the, for the country, the first load of uh, vaccine actually came through our, our Hamilton International Airport. Yes, and yes. And that, uh, that then got distributed right throughout the country. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, with a whole lot of criticism, criticism early on, there was a, a international challenge to try and get vaccines to, you know, all the countries that it c could afford to, uh, to take them on. And so Canada, I think at the end of the day, did pretty well getting it, could never be soon enough. Obviously there was anxiety and concern and, you know, when are we gonna get this so we can get that level of protection, but it ultimately came. And I think our federal and provincial governments have done a terrific job of kind of getting us to that point. But then the rollout in terms of getting that into the arms of individuals on a localized level has been a massive, massive effort. I mean, there's a book to be written about 
what uh, cities had to do and what pub public health uh, institutions had to do, what our hospitals needed to do to protect uh, citizens in our community. Uh, they have done such an amazing job. Uh, we seconded about three or 400 city employees into the vaccination and contract tracing process. So someone that normally would be cutting grass uh, through public works was actually sitting at a desk calling people, contract tracing on uh, contacts of people that had COVID or they were, you know, volunteering or not volunteering, employed at mass vaccination site to record the individuals who were there or to sanitize each, each location when the, the vaccine was done or they were administering vaccines on a, on a day to day. And, and that effort is still ongoing today. So we now have four different locations with clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now vaccinating kids from five to 12, which uh, you know has, has something that uh, many, many families and parents have been looking forward to. So the drive continues and, uh, and the booster is on its way. And so uh, all of that has been a monumental, massive effort. Someone will write the book one day. With the pandemic and the third booster rollout, do we have a plan in place for that? Our great public health team has, uh, you know, has been preparing for the kind of the, the vaccination of children and the vaccination of the, or the, the booster shot vaccination process for months already in anticipation of uh, getting the go ahead to move forward on this. So all the clinics are set and ready. We have a clinic at Lime Ridge Mall. We have another one at Centre Mall. We have one in the West End and and uh, not, not, not any longer at First Ontario, but one on the, the West Mountain as well. All of them capable of doing thousands of vaccinations each and every day. And I know the rollout is gonna be spectacular. So for those that are, as they are eligible, we can't have everybody going all at once. But as they are eligible, uh, we are, we're going to be able to get everybody uh, that wants to be vaccinated, vaccinated. If you could send one message out there to people who are still hesitant about getting vaccination, getting vaccinated, what, uh, what would you say? What would you say? I, I would say, uh, you know, there, you, 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 if you want to protect yourself, get vaccinated. If you want to protect your family, get vaccinated, and more importantly, at the end of the day, uh, you have a community responsibility. You have a social responsibility to help our community continue to prosper and to continue to do well and keep each other safe. And I think even, you know, at the end of the day, even that responsibility may, might override even your own personal choice in terms of what you wanna do, because you have, a, you have others in your community that you wanna be mindful of and protecting. So if uh, nothing else, do it for your community. I remember the almost joyful vibe getting my vaccination at the first Ontario Centre. It was just, there was an excitement about it, a relief about it, and, and I think that energy really sustained so many Hamiltonians through those um, very scary months. But was there a moment when you thought, oh, like, I can't sleep tonight? There were, there were many, I think, uh, for me and many others in our community, I think, uh, anxious moments. I mean, who'd have, who'd have thought that, <laughs> as mayor, I would be, uh, you know, instructing people to stay home, to not go to the park, not uh, only go to the grocery store one at a time, get in there quickly and come out uh, as quickly as you can and go home. Mm -hmm. uh, don't take the, uh, the escarpment stairs because people are going to be too close together. Uh, when you're out and about in the community, stay six feet apart and keep your mask on. I mean, it was literally a, you know entire shutdown of our municipality for all the right reasons. But you know what, I, I would never have expected to be the person that would have had to ultimately say we need to do this. Now, having said that, there were a lot of great people that uh, that were part of the emergency operations center. Dr. Richardson uh, at uh, Public Health that was really kind of orchestrating where we needed to adjust and where we needed to pull back and, uh, and, and restrict things. Uh, but those restrictions were difficult and uh, you're really worried about the psyche of the community and are people going to come along? Are they, are they going to accept uh, the advice that they were giving them to, uh, to stay home and then ultimately get vaccinated? And, uh, and the good news is the vast majority of the population uh, understood what we were trying to tell them, understood why it was necessary to, to shut down, to slow down, to separate, and also understood why vaccines were so, so critically important for the future health and well-being of our citizens. So the community at large was the, was the reason why we did as well as we did. All the things that we might have said or, or advised people to do, uh, if they decided not to do it, we would have been in, in dire straits. 
And so uh, the vast majority of the population were there and they get it and they still get it to this day. And very mindful of uh, their community responsibility to ensure that we can uh, continue to enjoy the restaurants and continue to go to the football game coming up or ah, yes. get to the theater or have that concert uh, that uh, you know hasn't been able to be had in the last couple of years. So really a sense of relief, but mm -hmm. also a sense that uh, there, are, there are lots of things to worry about. Mm -hmm. I tried to worry for the whole community, I think, uh, and, but you know, try to try to give people the best advice we could have, and uh, and to to not not sugarcoat it, be very direct. The task force, the recovery task force, um, are you happy with what it was able to accomplish during those months? Yeah, uh, they uh, you know they really kind of led us into a whole lot of areas that otherwise we might not have gotten to, uh, especially on the recovery side, and so the restaurants and the patios that we were able to engineer. Uh, how we are, are going to continue that into the future as part of our economic recovery, very, very important. It highlighted some of the social challenges that we've, uh, we've identified. There's the Just Recovery Task Force, and I think we've merged the two of them together. Uh, there are some, some glaring uh, challenges that this pandemic has amplified, whether it's in long-term care facilities or in our, our shelter system that we had to expand significantly to try and keep people separated. And as a result of the pandemic, obviously caused a lot more people to have financial uh, and or mental health or social challenges. And those, those areas are, I think, a lot more, we are more able to focus on the, those areas and do a better job going forward. And hopefully, when we come out of this pandemic, that uh, our federal and provincial partners will put the appropriate resources into those areas that uh, were identified as glaring gaps in our kind of social infrastructure. The best way to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant of concern is to get fully vaccinated and get a third dose of vaccine as soon as possible. Continue to protect yourself and your loved ones by staying vigilant and following the well-established public health measures, including wearing a mask properly, maintaining physical distance, limiting your number of contacts and the size of social gatherings, and staying home when you're unwell. Let's go to some good news. The mm. economy, yeah. Hamilton's economy. I don't think I ever recall in recent memory seeing so many cranes construction cranes in the skyline. That all ties in, I know, with the approval of the LRT and your whole vision for intensification and revitalizing the entire urban core. Yeah, there's that and there's there's job creation. Uh, you know, when we think about the airport, uh, you know, and the kind of the boom of, uh, of air, uh, you know, airport or, or click economy related uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're seeing some shrinking on, on the retail side and that's, uh, you know, as a result of that uh, online economy. But we're also seeing some really strong expansion on the online distribution center space. So the Amazons and the DHLs are, are, are going to employ thousands of people. And so for me, you know, residential will come. And I th it's good to see, you know, commercial residential buildings happening downtown. I think that's very important. It's kind of intensification that we want to uh, encourage. LRT will do a lot of that as well and certainly uh, provide a lot of employment, a lot of investment dollars coming into our city, some $5 billion of, of uh, construction activity is going to be good for our economy locally here. The more important areas that I think we need to continue to focus on is those job creating areas so that we're providing employment opportunities for people in, a, in our city. And the good news is that we are the most diversified economy in the country, according to uh, the Conference Board of Canada. And that, that really means that we've been able to provide employment opportunities, not just in the steel sector or not just in the manu manufacturing sector, but in the healthcare, in the, uh, in the university sector, in uh, um, the bio, bio, biosciences and biotechnology, in the automotive uh, areas where there's a you know, significant amount of research happening. All of that could lead, it will lead to products being made right here in Hamilton. So the future for Hamilton, I think, is we're, we're reestablishing ourselves as an economic engine in the country. And that, uh, that certainly was the, the case when we were the steel industry you know, leaders or across the country. Yes. Uh, we are now very, very much more culturally diverse and employment diverse as well. And that's the, that's the good news for our city. Speaking of diversity, um, you resigned as chair of Police Services Board. Mm -hmm. um, what motivated you to do that? 
pure, purely and plainly diversity. So I wanted to ensure that we were able to, uh, at the very least, get more women onto the uh, police services board. Uh, so I was pleased to see uh, Judy Partridge being selected as, uh, as a, the first woman in 25 plus years to be appointed by the city of Hamilton to the police services board, which I think is, not, is a very dubious record. I think uh, it should never have happened that way, but my whole motivation was to ensure that, uh, that more diversity landed on the board. The, the secondary good news was I was able to nominate Pat Mandy, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the first female indigenous chair of the board, not the first female, but certainly the first female indigenous chair of the board. She'll be absolutely fantastic. Uh, for those that know Pat Mandy, she's a very well accomplished uh, former leader in the, uh, the Nurses Association as well as uh, director of one of the local health integrated networks. Uh, so very, very experienced, uh, very uh, well, well regarded and respected individual that I know are gonna, is gonna do a great job. So for me, I was on the board for 11 years. Uh, you know, I, when, I, when I took on the chairmanship role, I said I didn't intend to stay for the entire term. Then pandemic happened and you know, then the Life chief happens. retired and, and then we needed another chief. And then well, as a result of the chief stepping up from deputy to chief, we needed another deputy. So once we got all that done, I decided it was time for me to move along. So uh, very happy with the, con the, the construct of the board right now. It's a really good, diverse group of individuals, have great uh, passion and compassion for, uh, for our community. And, uh, and I know they're gonna serve as well. And hopefully that will really um, ease some of the tensions that we've seen between police services and various sectors of the community. Well, I hope so. I mean, it, it, uh, it takes willing partners to be able to do that. I, I know that the police and the police services board is very willing and ha always has been in a space of wanting to collaborate with the community at large and that, that work will continue. What we need is uh, partners in the community that are prepared to do that as well. And so much excitement to look forward to with the waterfront. I mean, we've known forever that Hamilton has this wonderful waterfront and it's taken some time to get things going, but things are happening now and you've got a vision of much more excitement coming down the pipe. Yeah, you know what, so this is the, the waterfront is kind of an overnight success, 25 years in the making. So as you recall, the, uh, the property was originally owned by the Port Authority and has mm -hmm. transferred over to the city of Hamilton. And since then, we've been actually marching towards more accessibility in all parts of our waterfront. So from HMCS Star all the way over to Coots Paradise, we have now walkways. Uh, we now see uh, additional facilities coming to, uh, to the waterfront and on Pier 8 itself, a whole new promenade, Cops Pier, which is virtually finished. And then the uh, second part of the development, which is uh, new housing on that site, some 1,200 units of housing right on the water's, water's edge, uh, uh, all with some commercial on the ground floor and additional residential on top. So th that this is gonna be a signature development for the city of Hamilton in terms of waterfront development that everyone wants to get to. So who doesn't want to go for a walk down at the waterfront? People are you know, either going to the lakefront uh, along Confederation Park or they're going to the waterfront along uh, Bayfront Park and Pier, uh, Pier 8 and Pier, uh, Pier 7 and Pier 5 and Pier 6. So all of those future past piers, no sorry, past piers that were commercial shipping uh, 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 opportunities are now recreational uh, housing and, and, and accessible opportunities for people to get to the waterfront. And the good news is that the harbor water quality has improved significantly over the last 40 years based on the investments that we've been making in terms of improving the water quality. So it's gone from a, a, a basically an open sewer mm -hmm. to now a fish and wildlife habitat coming back and the water quality being improved so much that accessibility to the waterfront is actually desirable. So really looking forward to the next generation of development there, which is going to be housing, starting on Guy Street. And water is always such a critical part of in infrastructure as a city grows and its population grows and there's more development. So managing that whole system is, is crucial. Is crucial. Yeah, and even city. more crucial now given climate change issues. Mm -hmm. And you know, today we can see uh, you know, where those climate in change impacts are having very detrimental effects. Uh, you know, currently as, we, as we're taping this uh, in British Columbia, they're seeing those significant flooding problems and uh, we're not immune from that. Uh, you know, every, every time it rains significantly, I worry about the system. 
the system being the sewer's capacity and the com combined over sewer overflow tanks and the capacity of the water treatment plant, all of which have had massive investments and continue to have and will likely continue to need to have additional investments relative to the climate change issues that we're facing. So, uh, but you know, the good news is that those investments have happened and it's ho held us in good stead. It has allowed us to remediate Hamilton Harbor to the best degree possible. Just finishing Randall Reef, which is one of the toxic hotspots mm -hmm. there that will be turned into some accessible space for future shipping and navigation. And then we have that massive housing development with 1,200 units on Pier 8, right next to formerly industrial sites that have now been transformed into people-oriented places. So the future of that area is very, very bright and indeed. And the production studios and as well. Films or film studio already exists now and on the former Tiffany lands, uh, uh, an even more progressive film studio is envisioned there that uh, really speaks to the future of the film industry in Hamilton, which is already very bright. Lots of filming going on throughout the city of Hamilton and uh, that is going to focus a lot of that employment opportunity on that former Tiffany lands right next to the GO station, which I think is an ideal location for, uh, for the film studio that uh, is already in development. And how about those Thai cats? What a season. Great season. The community great, rallied around them. Great opportunity to bring people from across the country to the city of Hamilton to host the Great Cup. What a delight. And to be able to do that again in 2023, thank you CFL. I think there's an understanding that we failed to have the Grey Cup in 2020, which was originally envisioned. Uh, no, no one had an event in 2020, or nor did they have much of an event in 2019. So hopefully, uh, hopefully in 2023, we'll be able to have the full post-pandemic uh, celebration of the CFL and uh, the Tiger Cats and, and football in, in this country, which, you know, for, in, in every respect is probably the largest single sporting cultural event that we have in the country. And so uh, a great way to bring the community together. And more funding? Province has been very generous. I would say the province, this, this government has very, been a, a good friend to the city of Hamilton, notwithstanding the, the you know, th $1.7 billion that they put into uh, our uh, LRT system, which I think is gonna be a huge investment and uh, our traditional transit system, but for football and the CFL and for the hosting the Great Cup, they've uh, kicked in uh, $1.5 million for the, you know, the past event and another $1.5 million for 2023, which is very, very helpful economic stimulus for, uh, for our community. So very grateful for that. 2022 is going to see a lot of ramping up for the, that Great Cup, and it's also going to see a municipal election. Holding public office is becoming very daunting. Uh, the scrutiny, the criticism, uh, warranted or not warranted. What, what keeps people going? What keeps you going? And you've had protesters show up on your front lawn. All the acrimony about all the issues that have gone on through this past year. Are you up for another run? Are you going to run again? I'm definitely up for it. Uh, you know, I, I, I always work at this as, uh, on a team approach. Uh, we have great people. I mean, there's 7,000 people that work for the city of Hamilton. Uh, we have great uh, leadership in terms of city manager and all of our departments have great leadership as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm one of many that, uh, that participate in making our city go and I'm very, very optimistic for the future of our city. Uh, am I going to run again is still an open question. I'm very focused on pandemic and booster shots and uh, vaccinating our kids and getting all of that work done to make sure it gets done effectively and helping to continue to promote our post pandemic economic recovery. Uh, that is going to occupy certainly my time in the next two or three months, but uh, sometime in the, you know, the early, early next year, I'm going to have to make a decision and I'll let you know. I will have to ask the question again then. Indeed. Mayor Eisenberger, thank you and Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here and I wish everyone uh, very, very happy holidays and a great 2022. Well, our thanks again to Mayor Fred Eisenberger for joining us and taking the time to be with us here today. 2021 has been a year of challenge, perseverance and resilience for the city of Hamilton. As we look ahead to 2022, we are hopeful and confident it will be one full of promise and prosperity for all. On behalf of everyone here at Cable 14, we wish you all nothing but the best for the new year. I'm Connie Smith. Bye for now.